here to discuss is Sanam Vakil. She's director of the Middle East program at London's Chatham House think tank. Welcome to the program. So do you feel, like apparently the Secretary of State does, that things are really teetering on the edge right now in terms of the war expanding from Gaza and across Israel's northern border into Lebanon? There is a deep concern. What has become almost normalized, simmering tensions could really boil over. And that's really where we are. We've had attacks coming from the Houthis in Yemen um, that have uh, attacked uh, maritime shipping. Uh, we have seen back and forth between Hezbollah and Israel at a dangerous level, despite the regular messaging from Hassan Nasrallah that there is no intention of regionalizing this war. Uh, there have been attacks in Syria, attacks in Iraq. Um, and, and this could very well lead to a miscalculation. Can, can I just point out and just emphasize what you just said about Nasrallah? Kim Gattas, as you know, Beirut-based journalist, has tweeted, um, Hezbollah and Iran have signaled clearly, repeatedly, they want to avoid a wider war. Israel keeps testing that position. At some point, it will miscalculate. This was after these assassinations um, that we've just been talking about. You know, you know the region. Everybody thinks they have a playing a very clever game, you know, targeted mm -hmm. just so, calibrated mm -hmm. just so. But is miscalculation something that could happen? I mean, the Israelis and the Lebanese have already seen what happened across their border in 2006, most notably. Yes, I mean, this is the clear risk. And this was part of uh, Anthony Blinken's uh, primary objective uh, for this trip, uh, to message that escalation is not in anybody's interest, uh, the problem is that there are two different uh, sort of strategies and, and, and timelines underway in the region. No country, uh, no state or non-state actor in the region is really pushing for escalation, whereas uh, the Israeli government is uh, trying to reset um, its deterrence levels since October 7th, and that requires them uh, not only to try and uh, decapitate Hamas leadership, which we know 94 days on from October 7th they haven't been able to do, but also to try to push back Hezbollah and make clear that their borders are safe. And, and that's what's on ongoing right now. Whereas the rest of the region, be it Iran, be it Hezbollah, be it the wider um, Arab partners of the United States have no interest in seeing this explode because this could really take things into a new orbit. And just remind uh, everybody, I mean, I covered the 2006 war. It wasn't a victory by Israel or, or by Hezbollah. It, it, at best, was determined mm -hmm. to have been fought to a draw. Then there was a UN resolution, I think it's 1701, that required them to move back from, from demarcated lands. Apparently, neither of them kept to that uh, commitment. So is there a political solution that actually can reinforce and de-escalate the Lebanon or the Hezbollah-Israel tension right now? Well, uh, Amos Hochstein, uh, another U.S. official, was just in Lebanon, I think, for uh, this very issue, trying to find a space-saving solution to push Hezbollah back, according to UN Resolution 1701, past the Litani River, um, and uh, also find a face-saving way for Hezbollah to do that. There have been suggestions that Hezbollah is pulling back. But at the same time, uh, you see the Israelis keep pressing and keep striking at uh, commanders in, in uh, Lebanon. And, and this might be low-level escalation, but there will be one day uh, where this goes too far. And this could be a very different war than 2006. I spoke um, just when all this sort of flared up to uh, the Lebanese uh, foreign minister, mm. who was, at the time was in Washington and was about to visit the White House to talk about these tensions. This is what he said to me, partly. We don't want any escalation in the war. We don't want uh, what's happening in the South to be spread to over Lebanon. We don't like a regional war because it's dangerous to everybody. Dangerous to Lebanon, dangerous to Israel, and to the countries surrounding Israel. I mean, he's pretty much laid it out, but it's very important for the prime minister of that country, an ally of the United States, uh, to be saying that. How does um, Israel, if, if it does broaden into a big war, how do you separate a war against Hezbollah from a war against Lebanon itself and the Western-backed Lebanese armed forces, which have also been targeted? I don't think you can, really. Uh, and I think this is, again, why... Because the Israelis say we're not striking, the, you know, the Lebanese state. This will be seen as a broader war. 
Uh, and it's a war that uh, won't just be about Hezbollah. Uh, this will involve uh, the whole system. Hezbollah itself um, is embedded into that system, and it is part of uh, the governance system, uh, you know, whether the international community or the Lebanese like it or not. And, and that in itself is the problem. I want to ask you a couple of questions. In the Times of London this Sunday, the Sunday Times, you might have read it, there was a front page article by an Israeli journalist, Anshel Pfeffer, mm -hmm. who talked about the stash of papers and documents and maybe hard drives that some of the Israeli forces had found apparently in Yahya Sinwar's office. Um, it talked about there, it was from, from, from a couple of years ago, but talked about trying to disrupt any kind of normalization, whether it was at the time between Turkey and Israel. Um, and, it, and it talked about, you know, their sort of strategy in the reason. Then before, there was also, you know, I think Chatham House even put this out, Bronwyn Maddox, who used to be a journalist, had interviewed years ago Ahuri, the Hamas leader who was assassinated. And he had said to her that our aim is to uh, radicalize, in her words, the Palestinian population so that they do not go towards peace. And Hamas, you know, wants to delegitimize uh, the Palestinian Authority and sort of disable any sentiment towards peace. Do you think that's still what they think? And in which case, how does one get, get, get over this? How does one get to a day after? Well, certainly, uh, there are elements of uh, Palestinian leadership, Hamas leadership, uh, that have uh, more radical sentiments. I think uh, where we are today is uh, uh, normalization has slowed, if not stopped completely, um, and will be very uh, far and hard to achieve without a ceasefire and without attending to the humanitarian issues on the table, as well as um, without a plan uh, that addresses uh, the issue of Palestinian statehood that has been completely abandoned. So that's, I think, primary task um, here. But beyond that, uh, what is urgently needed is uh, a pathway uh, that creates uh, a process where Palestinian leaders can work together uh, for reform, accountability, governance, um, with elections at the end of this process. Um, and uh, an opportunity for Palestinians themselves to elect their future leaders should certainly be um, an opportunity uh, given to Palestinians, uh, not one that they've had uh, for well over two decades now. Yeah, they haven't gone to elections. Um, last question. You are an expert and a student of, of the Iran piece of this whole picture. It also seems to be trying to staying out of a direct confrontation. How long can that last? And what really does Iran want out of all of this? Well, Iran's motivations are, are multiple. Um, ultimately, the Islamic Republic has always been driven by its own sense of survival above all. And its security and stability has always been paramount. It has relied on the axis of resistance, this network that it has cultivated and created over a number of decades. Um, as its primary uh, tool of deterrence against Israel and the United States, uh, two countries that it has defined as its threats in the region. Um, and so it will continue to support the axis of resistance. But at the same time, I Iran does see uh, the U.S. as a declining influence in the region, a, a destabilizing uh, regional influence above all. Um, and Iran has, over the past few years, restored ties with the Gulf um, Arab countries, um, it is looking to forge stronger economic linkages and be part of uh, an integrated Middle East as well. Um, and that, of course, is hard to achieve with its oppositional stance with the United States, its accelerating nuclear program, and, of course, this underlying tension uh, with Israel that is, I think, uh, Tehran is calculating will increase over this year in particular. And just very briefly before, before I let you go, do you think there's a, a way to pull things back? The Israeli foreign minister told the U.S. foreign minister today they are looking for some kind of diplomatic solution. Yes, I think there is. Uh, and it begins with a ceasefire. That ceasefire can set the pathway forward uh, to uh, release hostages uh, that have been completely neglected, as Gideon Levy um, brought up in your previous interview. Beyond that, of course, um, the Arab states, partners of the United States, are going to need to play a really important integral role in guaranteeing Palestinian security, Israeli security, providing a bridge uh, to Iran, making sure they're not an, a spoiler in what comes next. This is going to be a long process. Waiting for the day after to begin that process is a bit too late.
Salman Bakir, Chatham House, thank you so much indeed for joining us.